talk about telescopes, the different types of telescopes. Um, we're going to start with the ones everybody knows about, the optical ones, uh, and then we're going to get into the real weird ones starting after that. Um, but first, let's talk about how optical astronomy works and how telescopes work in general. Um, and we start with a lens. So a lens, as you can see, is a piece of curved glass uh, that bends the pathway of light passing through it. Um, and then the bending of this light from one transparent medium to another is what is known as refraction. Um, and so a single, a single lens that you probably know about can magnify a nearby object, creating a larger image of it in your retina, make it easier to see. Um, but when it comes to astronomy and telescopes, celestial objects are usually far too far away to be magnified using a single lens. Uh, they talk about comets, planets, and galaxies as an example. And so a telescope then uses a combination of lenses and also mirrors uh, to collect light from distant objects. Um, and so we have two main types of optical telescopes, uh, refracting and reflecting. The easiest way I think to remember this off the top, just, uh, you know, off the top is that mirrors reflect, right? Lenses refract. So reflecting telescopes use mirrors, refracting use lenses. So again, a refracting telescope uses a combination of lenses to collect light from a distant object. Um, and it has an objective lens is at the end of the telescope closer to the object observed. Uh, and then the light passing through that lens is then refracted, so it creates a, an image on the object near the back of the tube. That image is known as the focus, uh, and then the distance from the lens to the image is the focal length of the lens. So I'm going to actually go back to this. I'm going to just use this as a kind of um, it's a palette here, I guess, right? So when you have a lens, right, and it, and it takes in an image, right, uh, it takes in an image, and then it refracts it into, you know, this more focused image, right? Wherever it focuses is at, right, behind it, that is the focus, right? And so what you, what, what, that's the focal length, right? The length from the lens to the image that it produces, right? Not the, not the image that it is looking at, right? That is the focal length, okay? Uh, I just want to make that clear just because I remember a few years ago when I was, when we were first learning about this for lasers, I was uh, very confused by it all. Uh, that was a rough, was a rough one for me. Um, and then we have a second lens, which is the eyepiece that enlarges the image produced by the objective lens, right? So basically then the eyepiece focuses at the, fo at the image that the original objective lens creates and enlarges that image, right? Acting as a magnifying lens. Right, and then you view through the eyepiece, of course. A reflecting telescope, again, as mirrors reflect, uh, uses a curved mirror instead of a lens. Um, and then uh, we have the primary mirror, which is the large mirror of a reflecting telescope. Um, it's the main one that most, like all reflecting telescopes have to have a primary mirror. There are sometimes secondary mirrors. We'll talk about that in a bit. Um, Isaac Newton is known for creating the first reflecting telescope in 1688 which have become instrumental in, you know, almost every astronomical discovery uh, that uses visible light. Um, it's in, an example they brought up is the discovery of Uranus by William Herschel in 1781. A Cassegrain telescope is a type of reflecting mirror that has a primary mirror and a smaller secondary mirror that reflect, reflects light back through a hole cut into the middle of the primary mirror. I don't know if it's in the middle per se, um, which creates a more compact overall form. Um, the Hubble T Space Telescope is an example of a Cassegrain telescope uh, deployed in 1990 from Space Shuttle Discovery. It had a 2.4 meter concave mirror as its primary mirror, which is pretty large, uh, and then a 0 0.305 meter secondary mirror. Um, and today it's in operation. And actually what we're going to start doing here at this point is to start kind of categorizing our different telescopes based on the... Um, based on the electromagnetic spectrum. So um, I want to use this color, I believe. So uh, in the visible light spectrum is the Hubble Space Telescope, uh, which was first created, uh, first uh, launched in 1990. Okay. Um, <clears throat> uh, we also have the Keck Observatory in Mauna Kea, Hawaii. Um, which has two reflecting telescopes with a segmented mirror design. Um, it's actually, I meant to look these up. Let's kind of look at the uh, different, let's look at the different um, telescopes here that they're going to be showing us. All right, so here, uh, let me pull up the Hubble. 
So here is the Hubble Space Telescope. Oh, that's not what I, okay, that's fine. Um, here's the Hubble Space Telescope. Um, the Not the telescope itself per se, right? I'm assuming that's here on the end. Um, but that is what that looks like. Uh, the, uh, let's see here, the Keck Observatory. Um, let's see if we can find a good example of what the mirrors look like. Open image. Nope, that's not, I don't want to open that image. Um, here we can see the two, uh, we can see kind of bits of the two telescopes, right? Okay. Um, so, yeah, let's also put that down on our list as well, right? The Keck Observatory is also in the visible light spectrum. Um, and so, um, again, each of these two reflecting telescopes has a segmented mirror, uh, 10 meters each in diameter, which is much bigger than the Hubble Space Telescope, uh, one of the largest optical telescopes in the world today. So um, refracting telescopes are useful for viewing larger, brighter objects in the sky. So again, lensed telescopes, uh, such as moons and planets, but because many astronomical objects are too distant uh, for these lenses to really get a good look at, uh, mirrors are actually necessary because these mirrors kind of are able to collect more light and get that proper viewing of those large galaxies. Um, and the issue with producing refracting telescopes for viewing these distant objects is that it would require a massive lens to do so. Mirrors are able to be built large. Lenses, not so much, because a big enough lens is difficult and costly to do, and also large diameter lenses tend to be prone to sagging. Um, they're also, you know, very expensive. Uh, so reflecting telescopes tend to be useful for more astronomical research. Uh, the Keck Observatory telescopes, for example, couldn't hold their shape if they're made of glass, and instead each mirror is 36 hexagonal segments that work as a single unit, which I think we can actually see a little bit of, right? Yeah, we can see kind of those hexagonal segments here uh, within the image. Okay, um, so that's um, optical, optical telescopes, right? Optical astronomy. Oops, optical. Um, but we have other types of uh, astronomy here as well. We have radio astronomy, um, originated in 1931 with U.S. engineer Carl G. Jansky. So uh, let's go over here. Um, let's put his name in a different color just because he's a person um, as opposed to a uh, observatory. All right, Carl G. Jansky uh, first kind of invents this in 1931. Or, or he doesn't invent it, he kind of, I guess, discovers it in a way. Uh, he discovered radio waves coming from the Milky Way uh, and then started to kind of try to observe the rest of the universe with radio waves and, and has noticed that radio waves have been received from tons of sources, such as the sun, such as other planets, cold interstellar gas, pulsars, galaxies, and quasars. We'll get into what pulsars and quasars later in the resource. Um, and the big thing that really allows us to use radio astronomy quite well is that Earth's atmosphere doesn't block or scatter radio waves because they are so large. Um, and so radio telescopes can operate in cloudy weather or during the daytime as well, which makes them even better. Um, and radio telescopes will have a curved dish antenna, uh, and they have to be very large because of the length of radio waves to be able to capture them, right? And again, it kind of acts like the curved mirror in a telescope. Right, which is kind of crazy to think about, right? Um, radio waves collected by a radio telescope obviously cannot be seen, heard, or photographed. So what happens is that a receiver will collect, amplify, and record these images as an electronic signal. Um, and then um, <clears throat> computers will then take those images and display them as a bunch of different things, a radio image digitized, a contour map that shows the strength of the radio source, or what we tend to see most is a radiograph. And a radiograph is a false colored, colored picture that shows how the radio source would look like to a person with radio vision. Right? And they have an example of the resource of the Crab Nebula in radio waves. Um, one of the largest radio telescopes constructed is the Arecibo uh, Observatory. Um, I'm actually gonna look up a particular image. Let's see if I can find it um, here. Um, no, I cannot. Uh, that's okay though. Um, we'll open up the, the image here. Wow. There we go. Um, so here's the Arecibo Observatory uh, in Costa Rica. Is that right? Puerto Rico, sorry. 
uh, in Puerto Rico. Um, if you ever seen the movie Goldeneye, James Bond uh, movie, uh, the movie ends here. Uh, there's a whole fight scene that goes on here. It's very cool. Um, so the Arecibo Observatory began operating in 1963 as a 305 meter dish, uh, which means that it has a 20 acre reflecting area, which is wild. Um, and then we also have the Robert C. Bird Green Bank Telescope. Um, let's take a look at that one because it's cool to look at. Um, let's see if I can find a good image of it here. It's it's very interesting looking. Um, here it is, right? Um, yeah, it's it's got it's got a super cool look. It is the world's biggest, um, uh, the 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 biggest, uh, most powerful, accurate, sensitive, fully steerable radio telescope. Um, and it has this uh, dish that's specially focused, uh, shaped to focus radio waves to the side of the dish, so that a receiver collects the signal without blocking the dish from receiving incoming waves. Right. So, um, oh, also it, it is at the National Radio Observatory in West Virginia. So let's put this on the map. Both of these. Um, we got the Arecibo Observatory. Oops. Arecibo uh, uh, Observatory, which was in 1963. Was that the date? Um, yeah, 1963. Uh, and then the um, the Green, it's usually called the Green Bank Telescope. Uh, so we're going to shorten it to that. The Green Bank Telescope, uh, which is in West Virginia, which they don't give us a date for. But these are our radio uh, uh, astronomy, radio instruments, right? radio uh, telescopes in a way. Um, they're not telescopes per se. Um, <clears throat> next up is infrared astronomy. And infrared astronomy studies radiation from the infrared band of the electromagnetic spectrum. Weird, who knew? Um, and these were built in the 1960s. They don't talk about microwaves because we'll talk about microwaves, I think, in a later section. Microwaves are interesting um, in their kind of conception in the universe and their makeup of the universe. And so when we see IR telescopes, they are optical reflectors with an IR, an infrared sensitive detector at the focus of the primary mirror, right? So where the mirror would focus that image back out front, um, that is where the IR sensitive detector is, right? And so I guess we didn't mention that with, with mirrors, but where lenses create a focus behind uh, the lens, a mirror, of course, will reflect that focus back out, right? Um, and so the detectors of the infrared, the infrared sensitive detectors are cooled and shielded and cooled to about two Kelvin to ensure that uh, infrared waves from anything else, right? The thermal radiation that we talked about in a previous video is everywhere. And so they wanted to make sure that by cooling it down, it would not necessarily register infrared waves uh, from stray areas like people, equipment, observatory walls. How does that work? I don't know. Uh, don't ask me. I have no clue how that would work. Obviously, we know there's a there's a there's a relationship between the temperature of an object and the um, and the the energy it it emits. Um, but it, you know, I don't know how that. Maybe everything in the room is cooled at two k two Kelvin. I don't know. Um, and so another problem with infrared astronomy is that water vapor and carbon dioxide, two of the key components of our atmosphere, strongly absorb infrared radiation, which means that we, we would get a poor image of infrared and infrared astronomy. So because of that, we have to put infrared telescopes on high mountaintops because air is thinner and drier there. And then even then, we put them in airplanes, balloons, rockets, and even spacecraft to make sure that we can get the best infrared images possible. Um, so we got two examples here of infrared astronomy. Uh, the Stratospheric Observatory for Infrared Astronomy, also known as SOFIA, uh, is an airplane uh, that flies a 2.5 meter reflecting telescope at an altitude of about 40,000 feet or 12 kilometers, which is a collaboration between the United States and Germany. We also have the NASA Spitzer Space Telescope launched in 2003, um, which trails behind the Earth in a heliocentric orbit. Um, I don't know exactly how that works, uh, but it carries an 85 centimeter telescope. Uh, so it's going to put those on our list. Um, we got Sophia, and we have the Spitzer Space Telescope, uh, and the Spitzer what did they say 2003. Okay. Um, so um, why infrared telescopes? They provide op celestial observation, celestial objects that are relatively cool or obscured. They are too cold to be seen with the visible eye. 
um, too cool to be seen by things like the Hubble Space Telescope. Um, and so um, the other thing also is that infrared rays are able to pass through interstellar clouds of gas and dust that are able to block shorter visible rays, which is also going to be important when we talk about microwaves later on with the cosmic microwave background. Um, and then they bring up, you can view false color images of the following at NASA's Infrared Processing and Analysis Center, IPAC, the cool, cooler stars and galaxies, not cool, like not the cooler Daniel, uh, just cold, right? Uh, regions of stars and planet formation and giant molecular clouds, comets, and galaxy centers. Okay. Now, lastly, we have a kind of big bunch of ultraviolet X-ray and gamma ray astronomy. Um, and so these are actually really, really important because a lot of the most energetic objects in the universe and the most violent events in the universe uh, release more high energy forms of radiation, for example, X-rays and gamma rays. Um, and UV X-ray and gamma ray telescopes have been sent above the Earth's atmosphere orbiting spacecraft since the 1960s. Um, and these telescopes create uh, feature solar arrays that generate electricity for instruments, right? Um, on top of this, they have insulation to protect these instruments from extreme heat and cold, from low pressure, from energetic particles and radiation in space. Um, and then on top of that, they have star tracking systems and gyroscopes to help orient the, the observatories and port, point them to sky objects on command. Um, high energy telescopes collect and focus on coming radiation, just like other telescopes. They detect the intensity, energy, and duration uh, of the of the radiation, and then also the direction it originated from. Uh, these telescopes get commands from ground control and then transmit data back to ground control via radio antennas. Um, and then after this data has been processed and, and analyzed, it can be digitally displayed. It can be displayed as graphs of intensity over time or an energy range, which reveals how the source is producing its rays, how bright it is, how long it remains at that brightness, and what kind of object it is. And I wasn't sure when writing these notes if they're saying these four things are done by all three of the different ways that the information can be displayed or just the energy range. I'm not sure. Um, data can then also be manipulated to create false color images, um, which uh, we, we've talked about pre with the previous section, I forget which one, radio waves, I think, um, where they create colors that uh, aren't, again, they're not colorful, they're not in the visible spectrum, but they kind of attach colors to these different things so people can see them, right? Uh, we've observed the sun, hot stars, stellar atmospheres, interstellar clouds, a hot gas galactic halo, and extragalactic sources with ultraviolet observations. Um, and uh, an example of a UV, uh, of UV space telescope is the Galaxy Evolution Explorer, which was launched in 2003. So here we will put uh, Galax, which is the same year as Spitzer. I hope they don't ever ask a question like that. That would be interesting. Uh, the Galaxy Evolution Explorer was launched in 2003, um, and it would it up to this up to that point up to this point I guess detected the faintest and most distant sources of UV radiation ever observed, and it was ret retired in 2012. I guess the implication is Spitzer may be still around. I'm not sure though. X-rays and gamma rays uh, are energetic enough to pass through ordinary mirrors and lenses. I think UV rays are okay. Um, and so what we have to do is use alternate ways to collect and focus the radiation. Uh, one of the examples of this is the Chandra X-ray Observatory, which was launched in 1999. Um, let's see if we can find a picture of this. I want to see what this looks like. Um, the Chandra X-ray Observatory. Um, let's see. Um, no, I'm not necessarily getting a good view of what it is, uh, like what the mirrors look like, just the, just the space observatory itself, right? Um, but uh, it has nested barrel-shaped mirrors, and so what would happen then is that the x-rays strike the mirrors at grazing angles, um, and then they reflect, they're able to reflect all these x-rays to a focal point uh, and form an image. Let's see if I can see a good image here. Um, yeah, sure. So here you can kind of see what it looks like is that um, you have this kind of, uh, uh, it looks like maybe light goes through here and then you have this barreled uh, kind of mirror, high resolution mirror assembly. Uh, and so it shoots the x-rays through all of here and then looks like it gets it at the very back. All right, so that's cool. Uh, so let's put Chandra on the list um, on x-rays. Uh, we have Chandra, which was 1999. Again, the implication being still around, but um, who knows? 
Um, and then lastly, we have the Fermi Gamma Ray Space Telescope, um, which detects sudden intense bursts of radiation, uh, presumably in gamma rays, right, which can uh, possibly include the presence of black holes, active galaxies, and distant quasars. So that is uh, the last one, the Fermi Space Telescope. Oops. That's not what I wanted to do there either, 1999. Then we got Fermi in the gamma ray area. Right. Um, so, yeah, that's about it for this section of covering all the different uh, different types of astronomy in terms of the electromagnetic spectrum. As you can see, the, we have instruments that cover most of the electromagnetic spectrum, and we do have stuff that covers microwaves. Um, but, again, uh, microwaves play a very, very interesting role in the in the cosmology uh, of the universe. So um, we'll come back to that a little bit later. Um, but yeah, here is the kind of different uh, uh, ways we can view the universe. We can view it through almost every part of the electromagnetic spectrum, uh, which is quite awesome. Um, from the Arecibo and Green Bank Telescope uh, to for radio waves, Sophia and Spitzer uh, Space Telescope for infrared, uh, the Hubble Space Telescope and the Keck Observatory for visible light, uh, Galax for UV light, Chandra for X-rays, and Fermi for gamma rays. Uh, that is uh, all the major ways that they covered. Uh, and then the final video, section one, uh, we're going to cover the two space race uh, uh, events of this section by Kinsolman.